so you know obviously we have a ton of normal needs and requirements and they have their sort of so we have our own internal clouds and things to run like big batch jobs and there's a lot of like you know data gets shuttled around and it's not latency sensitive or even particularly performance but um and and finance or certainly trading is a huge 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 wide diverse um pursuit uh Mm -hmm. and it it, you know like in my current company we have some things that are we're trying to predict the future in months time and then you know it doesn't really matter how quickly you predict something that's happening in three months time because you've still got three months to take advantage of it right you know oh it took 10 seconds sure that's fine i've written the whole thing in python it takes you know 10 seconds to run and that's absolutely fine no one's no one's going to bat an eyelid at that um obviously if you're making a prediction that's five minutes in the future now 30 seconds if it took you 30 seconds to make a prediction that's eroded into your prediction it's now like your prediction is already 30 seconds old by the time you've made it you're like okay i can see that's problematic so um you know and we might want to make predictions at all these different horizons you know canonically you know like real estate folks will buy up large swathes of land and hope you know and that's one that's a perfectly valid thing to do and hold that for years and hope that it goes up in value um on the far other extreme you've got low latency traders who are more colloquially known as high frequency traders which is sort of less true because you can be you could trade once a day and if it's the right trade you can make a lot of money if you're very low latency but you know trading a lot isn't always a good thing although there are strategies that do do that but at that point you are peering down a microscope at every single packet coming in and out of your network. So the way that most financial institutions like exchanges, the places you can buy and sell shares or options or futures or whatever that work is that you have usually a TCP connection to the server. So like a regular, a bit like a you know, web server style thing, but it's a persistent connection with a relatively simple protocol to say, I'd like to send an order. And then it would say, congratulations, you've now, you're now the proud owner of 100 shares of Google. You're like, Thank you very much. It costs you this much, whatever, that kind of thing, right? So that's on the one hand. Now, the public exchanges that are uh, so-called lit, and not in the youth term of like awesome and cool <laughs> lit, but like um, not dark, if you've heard of dark pools and dark exchanges, that kind of thing. That means that they actually advertise and publish the information about what's going on inside their exchange in real time. Mm-hmm. So every time I place an order... Uh, it's a bit like going on eBay and registering that you would like to buy something, which is not actually what you do on eBay. I guess you, you, you register you want to sell something and you put a price, right? And then maybe you've got a buy it now price. And it, that means that I can then look at it after the effect, after you've placed it and go, oh, I will buy that actually. And you click the buy button and you get it, right? So, but there are sort of two stages to that. One stage is you register that I would like to buy it or sell it at a particular price. And then if that happens to match anyone who's currently on the system and you're, they're buying and you're selling and the prices agree and they're all they're better, then there's a match and the trade happens. But if it doesn't, it goes onto like a bulletin board of like, here's what everybody wants to buy or sell. And that's what Mm -hmm. market data is. It's the information that flows off of the exchange that says, here is the interest to buy this particular share. Somebody would like to buy 100 shares of Google for $100. You're like, I bet they would. <laughs> right, <laughs> because right. the pr- current price of Google is like 1000 or whatever it is, right? You know. Um, right. And there's nothing really to stop, you know, there are certain people who can place these orders in the market. It's not everyone. You can't just go on, to, you can't register on your Fidelity account or your, you know, your uh, right. Robin Hood account and do this. But you, you reach certain criteria and then you get this TCP connection and you get this um, data stream, which is essentially... Um, everything that possibly happens if you think of it as a database of orders that the exchange is holding every ad remove every trade every modify every exogenous event that could possibly happen on the exchange that affects its internal state is broadcast literally broadcast or in fact multicast to Mm -hmm. all interested participants and then you're expected to update your internal idea about what the market looks like from that change so you know you're trying to keep your internal database up to date with what's really going on in the exchange and then you run your magical mystical algorithm over it and go oh i think it's mispriced and so you'll go and buy it or no actually i will join the market and i will also say that i would be prepared to sell google for a thousand and one dollars or whatever and you know that's where the real right. magic happens and then clever maths people work it all out and then they they tell me how they would like it to work and then then, then i get involved again right i don't get involved in that bit um and there are there are a set of things you know like there are certain things that are very much like you can boil that information down into signals that you can feed to a machine learning system which then 
churns out some expected value and then you can make a decision based on that expected value. And that tends to be somewhat slow because you're doing some level of post-processing on that data and maybe you're matching it up with the other markets and other symbols and other things that are going on and you're throwing it through a model that's sort of relatively expensive to 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 operate and then you're making a decision and you're turning it around and then you're sending an order say hey i'd like to buy this and you know at that level you might be talking about hundreds of microseconds which is you know a long time in our world but also not a very long time in most other people's world right Right. or it could be milliseconds even or whatever but um and then as you get down and towards um trades that are that require less um finesse less Mm -hmm. like inference and they're more like well if the price of Apple suddenly shoots up, maybe the price of Google, maybe it's just a signal that all tech stocks are going to go up. You know, if you believe that, right? In which right. case, why don't you just quickly, as soon as you see the price of Apple go up, buy all of the other tech stocks and then hope that you get in before everyone else does and you buy while they're still low before they've actually caught up with the price of Apple, assuming that's a, a valid thing to do. Again, this is not financial advice. Please consult right. <laughs> your, your <laughs> Right. right. Um, but these are the kinds of things, you know, and at that point we call those lead lag trades where there's a very obvious like economic reason for two things to be linked. And then the only reason they're not linked is either because something idiomatic has happened in the world. Like, I don't know, mm-hmm. Apple have just canceled their uh, dry, self-driving car thing. And now, whoops, <laughs> the, it's not the tech sector that's going up. It's Apple that's going up. And now you're left holding like all these sh- shares that you didn't want. And that's a right. risk that you have to take as a, 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 a someone who's trading. Or... Um, you know, Apple went up and then it's a race between you and everyone else who knows that when Apple goes up, Google's going to go up as well, right? And then, you know, there, it's now you're playing, now you're back in the game, video games of industry where you're like, well, everyone's got the same Dreamcast because everyone's bought the same high-powered C- uh, computer. Everyone's bought the same high-powered networking card and they're using the same tricks to access the network card through uh, kernel bypass. There's no kernel involved at all. They've all got the same fast switches. They've all paid the exchange the same amount of money to get the same length of fiber optic cable, I kid you not, right. um, To so that you have the like essentially a level playing field level amongst all the people who can afford to do all these things, right? right? But level <laughs> nonetheless. And so the only thing that remains between you and the, 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 the other person down the road at jump trading as opposed to you know hrt or whatever the trading company is how smart can you how fast can you make this go mm. right how can i craft this to be faster and there was a time when that was all cpu all the time and that was really that was kind of the t- i came in sort of the mid to the end of that part part so like a lot of stuff that i was doing was 100 percent cpus it was these exotic network cars these exotic kernel bypass things and then during the time that i was there people started going, well, you know what's even faster than the CPU? Well, it's not faster than the CPU, but if you're only doing if this, then this, and you've got right. network packets coming in, we can do this in hardware and we can push it out to the edge even further and have an FPGA do this. Mm-hmm. And then you're into the world of like, well, something you could never do on a CPU is like, hey, by the time you get to the 15th byte of the packet coming in, you know if it's a buy order or a sell order and you can start going, oh, and you start sending a packet the other way so that as the light the laser beams on this way you started turning on the other and going well maybe we'll want to sell something on this and then you get to the end of the thing and just make a decision as it's flow, flowing through to say okay yeah now we'll buy now or ah uh, actually no let's not do that and put something at the end that either i mean you're not not so allowed to corrupt packets or anything like that but there are ways and means of of like getting to the end and going i didn't mean to do that actually you know i, I jumped mm-hmm. the gun a little bit but that's how folks are able to get down to nanoseconds between an action coming in and their reaction going out is they're actually pipelining between the incoming and outgoing events which is kind of mind-boggling i imagine you know when when new hardware is released that it's pretty important to evaluate that and decide whether to incorporate it right if it's going to give you a competitive advantage now if you are well you know there's the fpga hardware as well which could be a a separate conversation but let's just you know focus on maybe like cpus or something like that right right how how often are y'all turning over hardware in that environment because i imagine that you know as soon as there's something better it's you know optimal to to move over to that system so in the in the work that i had done before and without going into too much detail like it it became increasingly less important we had Mm -hmm. moved to fpga stuff and then the 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 speed of the cpus was more like how quickly can we reprogram or at least configure these fpgas to do the thing that we're we want to do i mean this is i think this is fairly common that the folks 
um, gravitate towards an FPGA design where you have like essentially a CPU, a software defined CPU that's like right. extremely tailored for deep packet inspection and if then else kind of state machine type things. And then the else is here's a block that I need to be sent out. Mm-hmm. But because you can't really make any deep maths, you can't do any huge math mathematical things in that. Uh, in that, you're you're really looking for particular key characteristics of the messages coming in, and so behind the scenes, there's the clever program written in C plus plus or whatever that's doing the real thinking and then going like, okay, I need to continually update and re send these if then else rules because Mm. i can see the big picture i know that a a moving apple more than two ticks will mean this kind of message will come through with the byte three being this and byte seven being that that's what i need to get over to the fpga because it's too dumb to really understand what's going on it can only look for like you know regular expression style things i have to keep changing the regex to find the thing that i want to find and then hope that it is actually finding that signal when it comes out of the noise i mean again I'm trying to blur it a little bit because I'm a bit vague right. on like uh, like how much I, I should be saying about this stuff. And I don't do this anymore for what it's worth. My current company, I've moved on from, from the company where I was doing the lower latency stuff, and it's much more quantitative trading. So it's a bit longer term, um, but it's still important to be fast. Anyway, so to your question about like whether uh, we were always on the cutting edge of CPUs, we weren't actually. It's, it's, mm. It was relatively expensive to make those changes. You know, we have these things have to be put in f- physically co-located data centers next to the exchange where they're trading for all the reasons of the cable needs to be the right length and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you normally need a lot of them. You know, you've got like 20 or 30 servers in a rack with these super fast switches in, and these careful cut through things and these companies that make... Um, almost like a phys- physical based um switch technology so they can you can split a beam in two send one off to one machine one off to another machine so it's not even really a switch in between them they both get a copy of the data or right. you know one goes off to your packet capture system um and one goes to your you know your trading system so you always have the exact thing that happens so you can do your simulations later and all that kind of good stuff um and so, like the changing the machines out, we, you know, they're, they're each, you know, you've got twenty of them in a rack, and they're all like twenty five grand each. That's that's a significant um, outgoing. Um, that's not to say that we didn't do it, um, and you know, we, there was definitely experimentation with unusual um, hardware. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, again, without going into too much detail there, uh, but I'll talk about one thing that I thought was an interesting one in terms of what it was. Sure. Um, so the um, there is a chip called a Tylera which was a relatively simple 32-bit RISC CPU, except it was a grid array of them on a single die. And mm. there were like either 64, I think, 64 of them, something like that, or 16 of them. I think there were 64, arranged in a you know 8x8 eight eight grid. And the peripherals hung around the chip on the outside. And so the, the, the sort of 8 at the top and the six and then the eight and the six whatever however you want to think of it the, the peripheral literal peripheral um, cpus right. could talk to the pins on the way outside you know they were all fully functional right they all had access to ram if you wanted to and all that kind of nonsense but a way of configuring it would be to say well i'm going to run linux on these top the top two left left hand corner ones um the rest of them are uncommitted and then i'm going to run dedicated programs on them and some of their registers would be like north south east and west and if you wrote to north, it would block until the processor above you had read from south, so maybe with a small FIFO in between them, something like this. Right. Um, there was also a, an on-chip network where you could send messages through uh, to a particular CPU cell, and it used like you know, New York taxi cab routing algorithm of like if if no one's reading or writing from north or south, then I'll go north or south, else I'll go east and west until I'm lined up left, right, or whatever. But anyway, right. what it allowed you to do was in software – do the kind of things that you do or you have to do naturally on an FPGA or an ASIC based solution. You know, effectively each of these things was a software pipeline stage. And so you could sit there and be like, okay, the Ethernet chip is up here and it writes 64 bytes or 64 bits of the Ethernet frame to the east every time it comes in. And the next the next uh, program is decoding the Ethernet frame, looking for the, the IP header. And then once the IP header is good, it then starts passing the UDP payload to East. And then the UDP payload gets to the next guy. And he's like adding, like looking for the particular things and decoding and then going, well, go South um, if it's this kind of packet if, or East if it's another one or North maybe. And then you can kind of actually define a physical route round the chip to get to a place where um, you are able to process particular sequences 
very efficiently because every clock cycle another 64 bits is going through or every other clock cycle or whatever it was and that's very similar to how you have to think about the world when you're doing hardware because everything's parallel you know like every transistor is its own little computer and you don't really have much choice about it you know and in fact we have to kind of impose our clock-based will upon it rather heavily to make it look like the kind of thing that we're expecting where everything moves along one step at a time and that, that this is an aside, but it was always a thing that made me laugh. Once I spent some time with our FPGA engineers uh, and really started, I believe, to grok the way that they thought about the world, the way that you have to do things, and the way that you can get this amazing speed up if you do it this particular way on an FPGA, I then we would have people come in and say, um, like vendors would come in and say, take your C++ code and compile it to FPGA, and you get the huge boost of speed. And I'm like going, it's... The compilation is not the problem. Which language you specify in it is not the problem. The problem is you have to think about it in a fundamentally different way. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's trying to write C++ is not thinking about how to, I don't know, uh, do a a, a 256-way hardware lookup because you're willing to dedicate 256 comparators or however many you can multiplex in and just go, well, this is fine. Like nine-tenths of my chip real estate is this set of comparators. But you know what? In one clock cycle, I know if it's interesting or not, right? And you can't do that in C++. Um, or any high level language really that other than, than, than these, these, uh, uh, HDLs. 